Hello and welcome to the Homeless Consultant channel. My name is Paul B. I am the Homeless Consultant. And in this video I am going to begin with existential threat number four of the 50 existential threats to the United States. Number four is a truly shameful and abysmal education system specifically public education but it goes even into the private education education was taken over many many decades ago by some very bad people people who want to hurt the country who want to bring it down they want to take the greatness of well-educated exceptional people of accomplishment in the past and they want to bring them down to the level of everyone else what we did before then was we educated everyone well so that everyone could strive toward extraordinary achievement our education system is dumbing people down it is not enlightening them it is not making them smarter brighter better, more competent. Our education system has become agenda driven. There is so much that students are exposed to that involve beliefs instead of facts. That involve improper thinking techniques rather than critical thinking techniques. Schools are also seeking to usurp the function of parents. They literally tell parents, while the, school, while the child's on our grounds, they're our property, essentially. You have no control over anything. Again, the family is one of the, found, it, if it isn't the foundational institution of the United States, I don't know what is. For a government institution, schools, to say that they're going to take over the duties of parenting for one-third of the day which is about one-half of the waking day of a child from the time that they are what five years old kindergarten up until they're 18 years old and then onward into college is lunacy look at our government look at what our government is it's incompetent it's negligent it's corrupt, it's vicious, it's stupid, it's a vile institution. It is what's called a necessary evil. And yet, we are allowing that institution through the schools to literally raise the American children instead of allowing their parents to do it. And that contributes significantly to the breakdown of the family, which is another one of the threats in here. The deliberate destruction of the family, I should say. A four-page U.S. Constitution in no way mandates or even implies that this is remotely acceptable when the whole point of the Constitution, everything in there, is to define very limited powers of government and all kinds of protections against that government ever overreaching its bounds such as taking over the entire role of a parent from the time a child is five years old until forever there's nothing in the Constitution that mandates or allows that nothing the spirit of that Constitution is 180 degrees opposite get the government out of our lives out of our families they have no business raising our children. King George III had no business raising the British children. And neither do these schools have any business raising American children. We send them to those schools so that they may be educated. They may be told facts. They may be taught critical thinking skills. They may learn through experience and example from competent and well-educated mentors how to do these things so that they can go into life and use their own unique you know personality traits their own unique mental facilities and use these tools and functions to go out and do great things 
Some people will do great things for their families. They'll become a wonderful parent to their children. And that's quite an accomplishment. Other people might come up with a new source of energy that gets rid of the need for coal and oil and nuclear. They're both doing equally great things. They're different things. Our education system is putting everyone into a box and instead of teaching them these critical thinking tools, they're teaching them what to think, what to believe. And it's going to be almost impossible for any American citizen to break out of that mold at the very least for decades after they leave school. And by then it's too late for them to do anything with it. This is a deliberate act of destruction of the human being in our schools. And yet, the very people who are behind this are the ones who you will see on TV opening and closing their mouths, talking about the children all the time. They're like those little puppets. The children. The children. Save the children. And all they're doing is hurting the children. They're reducing the children to the common denominator instead of elevating everyone to the greatest among us. Meanwhile, teachers themselves have been stripped of all independence and authority. They're given a syllabus, they're given a curriculum, they're even told how to teach particular topics. And if they come up with some clever way of teaching, they're not allowed to do it in many cases. They're not allowed to use their own unique personalities and their own unique way of communicating with people to be more effective at, at teaching the same thing that a different teacher is teaching in a different way in the classroom next door. These teachers are micromanaged. They're, they're stripped of all their ability to be a great and wonderful mentor, even when they want to be. And yet many of these teachers have gone through our education system, so they're not very well educated to begin with. The teachers' unions. The teachers' unions don't seem to care anything about students. I don't see where they care anything. They care about increasing wages, increasing benefits, getting more days off of work. Here in Minnesota, I was appalled when I was brought, when that family took me in for a while. I had to sit and watch those kids who were, I hate to say it, but um, they were not well educated. Let me put it that way, for all the time they spent in the school. They were taking days off school left and right, all the time. And I'd say, well, what's... Why are they off school? I mean, it's not a weather or anything. They say, oh, it's a teacher's... I don't even know what it is, but the teachers get like two or three days off in a week every month or every two months to do their paperwork? These are people who work nine months a year to begin with. So the students, instead of being in school, they were sitting in front of a television set for, you know, three days straight while these teachers... They, they take off school so that the teachers can sit there and do paperwork? Why don't they try working for a living instead? Stay late like my teachers used to. Do what you have to do. Set an example for these kids of how to have a work ethic. But that's what the teachers unions are doing. They don't care anything about the children. Most... Well, I'll say many, if not most, of the students in the American education system that graduate both high school and college effectively illiterate and innumerate. Now that doesn't mean they're walking around like Helen Keller, you know, <laughs> deaf, dumb, and blind. Okay, they know how to speak, sort of. They know how to read, kind of. They have a little bit of conception of numbers to some extent. But they're going through the American education system. How can they get out of high school with a diploma, especially if they're wearing the cord around their neck at graduation, and go out and you ask them a question about anything? Okay, on what continent is Africa located? Uh... I don't know, uh, isn't that in South America? You know, you can go on the internet and you can watch all these, uh, everyone from Jay Leno to the, there's a guy named Mark, I think, who goes around just asking people questions. Just simple things that any, education, any educated person should know or be able to figure out. And they don't have the foggiest idea what you're talking about. Show me the United States of America on this globe. 
and they just sit there and spin the thing. And they might recognize the pattern. That's the only way. But they don't know how the geography of the world is set up. Ask them simple questions about mathematics, about history, about science, for heaven's sakes. These kids are graduating and they don't know even a fraction of what a grade school student in America knew a hundred years ago. This is beyond shameful. Why would an education system raise children to be that illiterate and that enumerate? There's a reason for it. It's deliberate. The graduates also, they lack the reading comprehension skills they lack the knowledge, the numerical and mathematical skills, the critical thinking skills, and something that's completely absent from our school system today. They also lack the moral and ethical training that is necessary for them to serve as competent citizens. One reason the nation is going the direction it is going is because we are, they are not being taught citizenship. When I was in grade school, we had citizenship classes. There was a class devoted to how to be a good citizen. I'm not aware of anything like that today, and even if there is, all it is is go hold a sign to complain about something to your government. That's it. Nothing to do with learn the lessons of history and learn to value what a wonderful country this is and how unimaginably beneficial the Constitution is for us, how blessed we are to be here. There's nothing like that these kids are being taught. How can you be an effective citizen if you don't have knowledge, you don't know history, you can barely read, you can't comprehend what you're reading, you don't have critical thinking skills, you can't discern you can't tell truth from falsehoods. You can't identify when somebody is lying or manipulating to you. How can you be a, how can you be a good citizen in that case? It's impossible. But that's how our, sco our schools are training our students to be. I mean, I can't even carry on a conversation with a high school graduate, or a college graduate for that matter, most college graduates. I can't even carry on a conversation with them anymore because they don't know anything. They don't have any communication skills. They, they don't know how to speak properly. They can't even say what it is they're trying to say. It wasn't like that when I was younger. And what I went through was even a step down from what my parents had. Another thing we see, and we see this a lot with this radical left, all these pushes to whine and moan and complain about everything out there, graduates today, they possess almost no capacity to rationally defend or debate their beliefs and their opinions. They, they can't do it. They have these beliefs and opinions. They don't even know where they came from because most of it was indoctrinated. They picked it up on the internet. They were trained with it from in school. But they, they can't defend these beliefs. I'm losing my space here. I can hardly see the small print. You forgive me. Um, one of the things of living in this car has been it's deteriorated my eyesight tremendously. Um, let's see here. So these students, in many ways, these graduates, they've been reduced to defending their beliefs by calling people names and just blindly repeating lies that they've been told, that they've heard on the internet or from their teachers, and then they start shouting them at some point, and then they start throwing a hissy fit. That's how they debate. That's how they rationally explain their arguments. Look at what's going on with, with President Trump. If, if nothing else, this lunacy beyond every movement to impeach him, to get him out of office even before he came to office, regardless of whether you like Trump as a president or not. The point is, the behavior of these people on the left, which was largely, you know, manifested through young people who were enticed to come out, you know, and, and create a big stink all over the place. The behavior of these people has been so shameful and so shocking to the American people, it has really revealed exactly what I'm talking about here. 
But it's not just them, it's others who aren't coming out and shouting and screaming and whining and moaning about these things, about Trump. They also are incapable of defending their beliefs. I'll give you an example. There was a kid here in Minnesota when Trump, uh, when they had the elections going, and President Trump was, you know, not expected to win, apparently. I thought, I knew he was going to win all along. I didn't pay attention to the media. But this kid, he was 18 years old, fresh out of high school, and he told me Donald Trump is a racist. And I said, oh, really? Because I know a few things, so um, I kind of aware that that's not true so I asked him okay uh, would you give me one example please just one example of, of where he's done something racist been racist just just so, just so I know so to help defend what you're saying and the kid just kind of shook a bit and he's like well I don't have an example but I mean everyone knows it I mean that's all they talk about I mean it, it, he's racist I mean what's wrong with you and he started getting agitated and upset immediately and it didn't take long for him to just start you know calling me names and that was the end of that that was our discussion that was our debate Donald Trump is a racist oh really could you provide just one example to defend what you just said no, you jerk! What's wrong with you? Can't you don't don't you know Donald Trump's a racist? You idiot! What's wrong with you? And then he goes away to smoke pot because yes, he was a pot smoker, like so many of these teachers are and administrators are drug users. That was a horrifying encounter I had with that kid. Thirty years ago, when I had encounters with eighteen-year-olds, I had rational debates with them, discussions with them, and they were friendly even if we disagreed on things. That is what we get today from this Minnesota educated kid. And then he had to go smoke some pot to calm down because someone asking him a simple question was more than his brain could handle. That's our education system at work. Another thing that graduates are not taught and this is crucial you'll see that it's another one of the threats that I list out and we'll discuss in depth later graduates have no concept of even even a basic concept of the law of supply and demand which is the fundamental law of economics if you don't even understand the very basic fundamentals of finance and economics how can you be responsible and wise and effective with your finances and in the economy as a business person how can you do it as a taxpayer how can you do it as someone who's responsible for keeping your government in check when they waste the money that they steal from you at gunpoint called taxes how can you do that if you don't even understand the basic fundamental law of economics At the same time, these students are allowed to engage, once they're 18 years old, on their 18th birthday, they can engage in any kind of financial transaction. They can get credit cards. They can get student loans. On their 18th birthday. On their 18th birthday. They can get up early, go out before the family wakes up. No one has even said, welcome to the adult world, happy birthday yet to them, and they can have a credit card or a student loan. And these people don't even understand the fundamentals of economics or finance. They're, they're utterly ignorant of it. And at the same time, they don't even know the true value of, an edu of a college education, which is a pretty low value these days. But they don't know that. Here's another thing. Have you been on YouTube lately? You're watching a video on YouTube. How many times do you, I don't know about you, but I keep getting these video ads for this software called Grammarly, which is something that corrects your grammar. And some of those videos start out with the phrase, I believe it is, writing is hard. And every time I hear that, I just cringe. Because writing is not hard. Or I should say it is not difficult. Let me put it that way. Writing is not difficult. If you're educated. You see, the only time you need software to help you with your grammar 
is if you're not well educated, you didn't learn grammar, you didn't learn vocabulary in school, then you might need some software to help you write what amounts to a computerized, you know, whatever it is you're writing is going to be written by a computer basically. It's going to, and everyone who uses Grammarly is going to have the basically the exact same type of, of grammar and sentence structure because it's the software that's doing it for them. Now, I mean, I don't claim to know every single rule of grammar. I think I'm a pretty good writer. But you know what? If you have ten different people and they need to say the same thing, they need, they're, they're, you know, they have a, a book report on the same book, on the same topic of the same book, and they have to say the same thing. If they all use Grammarly, it, no matter what they say, it's all going to basically sound kind of the same. The feel, the vibe of it's going to be the same. But regardless of their relative skills with grammar and vocabulary, if they're free and if they're educated and if they don't need software to just get their basic grammar correct, then what you're going to get is their unique personalities and their unique styles showing through. And you're going to get ten different reports on the same topic and they're going to be interesting to the extent that they're, they're unique, they're different from each other. We're losing that completely because the students, first of all, don't even have those basic fundamental skills to do it themselves. And then to, co to compensate for that, they're using things like software to do the writing for them or to do the arranging of the words for them. So everything ends up generic sounding the same. This is disgusting. This is not an education system. If we had a competent education system by the law of supply and demand, by the law of supply and demand, if we had a competent education system, there would be no demand for Grammarly and it wouldn't exist because it would be unnecessary. See, this is the law of supply and demand right there. And yet it flies right over people's heads. They watch these videos, they watch these ads for Grammarly all the time and it doesn't even occur to them but I understand the law of supply and demand. So as soon as I see that, I think, why is this being sold? Who needs this thing? Who isn't being taught grammar that they need a piece of software to figure it out for them? And yet, no one else even thinks about that when they see these Grammarly ads. That's how far distanced we have become from true education. That's how far we've, we've fallen. And I urge you to think about what I just said there. The fact that you can watch a Grammarly ad and it never even occurs to you that by the law of supply and demand, the only reason this ad would exist is if our students are not being educated properly. Think about that. Because these are the things that schools do not teach you to look for and to think about. It's called critical thinking. Engaging what you see, the information that's presented to you, not just blindly accepting it and not thinking about it. I urge you to look at personal correspondence and especially love letters from anybody, really anywhere in the world, but you know, in this case, particularly Americans, from say World War II and before that especially when you get back to more of the Victorian era. Just look at the way they wrote. Their, their language was so beautiful, so flowery, so they were able to express what's in their heart so much better than people can today. Even the children, even the children, the, the correspondence between friends, and I'm not just talking about, you know, between John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, who were rivals who came to respect each other greatly over time. But look at how people, just in the Civil War, the letters from uh, soldiers in the Civil War, uh, back to their wives and their girls, and uh, to just look at the correspondence from back then and look at how much better they were at communicating. We don't have that anymore. We don't have that anymore. And that, that is a big sign. That is another big sign that we've got a big problem with our education system. Does anyone remember when I did a video way back when talking about 
how I'm stalked by school bus drivers, the people who are responsible for driving children around. The, these school bus drivers, they get some kind of a weird kick out of watching the homeless guy in his car because they have to sit in their bus and wait for people, you know, wait, wait to go pick up the kids. And I even showed you a video of where one parked his bus right next to me in an otherwise almost empty parking lot so that he could, you know, sit there and smoke a cigarette and just look into my car, look at me sleeping. I had the camera on while I pretended to sleep and this guy's just staring at me. This kind of a creepy person is, is what's responsible for driving our children around to schools. This is very apropos for what I'm talking about in this particular video. I'm in an otherwise empty park. There's nobody here. And there's several big parking lots in here. Look at where this school bus decided to park. facing me so that he can stare at the homeless guy who's talking into a camera. These are the kinds of people who are driving our kids to these rotten schools. We've got problems all throughout our education system. I've got some weirdo over there staring at me while I make this thing. Makes my skin absolutely crawl and yet the people of Minnesota are entrusting that person to drive their children around to school. Let's continue with this, shall we? When it comes right down to it, our education system is deliberately cultivating stupidity. It's cultivating a dumbed down population that is easily manipulated and controlled. When you're dumbed down, you are not independent. You are not free. You're a sucker. You're a sheep waiting to be slaughtered. And there's a reason why they are making sure that our students graduate without the skills that they need to take control of their own lives and their own country. Because these people want to bring our country down. They want to bring it down to the lowest common denominator just like you did in the Soviet Union. You have one Politburo at the top who runs everything and you have the masses. And the masses either do what those people at the top say or they get slaughtered. About 50 million of them slaughtered in the Soviet Union. That's what these people want for here. It's called communism, socialism, give it whatever name you want. Marxism. There's a reason why our education system is so bad. A lot of these teachers enter there wanting to truly teach kids. They want to see children grow from someone who doesn't know something to someone who has mastered something. A lot of these teachers want that for these kids. But they're not allowed to. They're not allowed to by the schools, by the school boards, by the teachers unions. They're not allowed to, like I said early on, they don't have the freedom and independence to teach in their own unique manner. So the graduates are they're graduating without any skills for being competent citizens but also if you don't have those basic functions if you don't have those basic capacities you can't function very well as a parent either you can't function well as a child you can't function very well as a neighbor you can't function well as an employee as an employer you can't function well if you're not well educated Most of our students, because this education system is so bad, they have no concept of the things they need to know to avoid repeating the mistakes of history. They have no concept of the history of socialism, the history of Marxism, the history of communism. They have no concept of fascism. They throw out the word fascist left and right and they don't even understand what it is. Ask them to define fascism. And granted, fascism is not something that's cut and dried, it's not a scientific term. It, it's a little bit wishy-washy in the definition, but almost never will they say it's a symbiotic relationship between government and corporations who exercise dictatorial control over the masses, which is what fascism is. And you can you can take it you know to the left, you can take it to the right from there, but that is what fascism is. Most people think that fascism is just some kind of totalitarian control of some sort. They don't even understand that corporations are crucial to fascism. They don't get it. 
They don't, these students have no concept of why nations exist. What's the purpose of nations? Well, if you don't understand why nations exist, then you're not going to be all that sad if you see your own nation be destroyed from within and merged with some kind of a world government. The problem is, nations exist for a good reason. A very good reason, which we will talk about in a future threat here. Let's see. Uh, students do not have any concept of political science or military science. If you don't understand political science, then, you see, if you understand political science, then what's going on right now, for example, with this impeachment, there would be such an outcry that the shame that these people who are perpetrating this coup against the American president, the shame and the punishment that they would receive would inspire future people to never repeat that kind of nonsense ever again, that kind of crime ever again. But you have to understand political science. If you don't understand how our political system works, then if you're a young person who's raised in this rotten education system, you might think that that impeachment inquiry is a part of our government, that it's not a coup, that it's not illegal and unconstitutional, that it is not a treasonable offense, which is a capital offense. If, if you don't understand that, if you don't understand that what someone like a Nancy Pelosi is doing right now, if she did exactly the same thing 230 years ago, she would have hung in the gallows. You're not understanding this. You don't understand this because you don't understand political science. And they see this as acceptable. If you don't grasp how serious that is, when a nation used to take this kind of thing extremely seriously, when you commit a coup against a democratically elected government, you go to the gallows. You don't get television time every single day. That's how bad our country has become because the students do not understand political science. They don't understand anything about our constitution, our, our way of government. They don't understand military science, so whenever something happens globally where our military has to be involved, people have opinions out the wazoo, but they, they're totally uninformed opinions. They don't understand what's going on. And I don't claim to be an absolute expert, but I have to say there's even people in the military who don't understand this. They went through the military. God bless them for doing so. But they maybe were in the Air Force or something, and then we have the Marines going out and doing something, and they don't understand the bigger implications in the world of, uh, you know, the, the, um, I'm so flustered trying to speak when I know what this person's doing in this school bus over here right now, which is really disgusting. Somebody's kid's going to go in there and sit on that seat, by the way. Most students have no concept, as I said, of finance and economics. How in the world can they manage their finances? How can they make sure that their family is secure? How can they pay for an education responsibly? How can they do anything if they don't understand the basics of finance? Back when I was young, you had to know how to balance a checkbook. These weren't things you just passed in class. You carried them with you through life. You didn't learn them long enough to pass a test and then forget about them. You learned them. Students aren't even exposed to them anymore, the things that they need to know. Students uh, have basically no concept of great literature. Great literature is the, it's, it's the way that people who are able to write beautifully can communicate things that are so deep to the common human experience, like Shakespeare, like uh, Melville, Moby Dick. You know, and that's what makes even people like Hemingway and Steinbeck great, even if I personally may not be a great fan of the individuals, I have to be fond of what they did. Mark Twain, and I'll go back and say Shakespeare a second time, because he was the master of it. All right, These people were able to get Homer's Iliad, the Odyssey, all these, you know, the, the Aeneid. These are, great literature is called great literature for a reason. It's a... These people were so magnificent at writing that they were able to communicate things that really are so difficult because they're, 
you know, things that we go through in life sometimes just overwhelm us, and it's so hard to communicate effectively. But you find a poetic or a, or a using storytelling, you find a way to communicate these things, and it helps us to feel more at home as part of the human species because we understand that other people go through what we go through. We're not unique. We're not alone. Great literature takes you to those places. It takes your imagination to wonderful places. You know, 20,000 leagues under the sea. Uh, you know, but students are not exposed to this literature. They're exposed now. I mean, a lot of the great literature that I was brought up with is now banned in schools. And instead, they're bringing in this junk that is meant to just drive one single agenda. You know, you must read this book because it tells you why being gay and lesbian is a great, wonderful thing. You need to do this be, uh, because, you know, it explains why Karl Marx wasn't such a bad guy after all. You need to read this because you need to understand why, you know, how to tolerate Islam. Okay, it doesn't tell the whole story. It doesn't tell the part about the knife to your neck. It doesn't tell that mandate. But it tells this other. You see, this isn't great literature. This is agenda-driven literature. The whole point of reading it is to indoctrinate people with certain beliefs. Young people, in this case. Young people are graduating from high school and college with uh, no concept of mathematics whatsoever. Whatsoever. Take them to... Go to the coffee shop. Go go to the store or whatever. I have been in coffee shops so much in Minnesota in particular where they have to give me change, but I'm trying to talk to them at the same time about something. And they can't do both at once. They'll actually pull the coins out on the counter, put them, you know, quarters, dimes, nickels, and try to count them. And then I see them shut their brain down while I'm talking as they count it out and hand it to you. The, the register's telling them 83 cents. And they can't just... They, they can't just grab it out there. 83 cents. What is that? Three quarters, a nickel, three pennies. Should be a no-brainer. These people cannot even count, let alone do mathematics. So many of these young people graduating can't even do these simple functions. Um, what about the great ethical and moral questions of humanity? As near as I can tell, that's not even addressed in, in high school anymore. What they're doing instead is they're trying to moralize. They're trying to say, you know, we, whoever we is, this institution of the school, we believe that a man who has a mental illness and thinks he's a woman should be treated, we, we should go along with that. We should go into their realm of insanity. And we should pump their body full of full of, uh, you know, uh, hormones and give them all this treatment, do some plastic surgery, do a little snipping here and there, and have them come out and then pretend to be a woman for the rest of their life, which probably won't be long statistically because the people who do that tend to commit suicide more than most people and have absolutely miserable lives. But we want them to have the right to do that versus, say, helping the mental, mentally ill. That's what students are shown. That's their idea of morality. Okay, so whoever runs the school has a personal belief, and whether it's that insane or if it's something a little more mundane, like my political beliefs lean a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, and I'm going to take you on a beeline to exactly what I believe. No matter what it is, it doesn't matter. The point is, they are not being exposed to the great moral and ethical questions that humanity has discussed from the beginning. It's been one of the main topics of literature and speech from the beginning. Political discourse. Because it matters. This is the first real, really the first generation that isn't exposed to these moral questions. They're not exposed to them much in their families. The churches no longer discuss it. And the schools are hijacking it. That's how bad our school systems have become. Beyond that, I would like to say that the Department of Education, which I don't even understand why it exists, I don't, I don't understand, because since we got the Department of Education, this is what we've gotten for our education system. Seems to me that they are a complete failure and they should be disbanded. In fact, I think some of these people ought to be held accountable in a court of law for what they have done. They are destroying a nation and they're destroying human beings' ability to be human beings. 
by destroying their education and indoctrinating them instead. But perhaps more important, the one thing I can see that the, that the um, education system does, the Department of Education does, the one thing I can see that they do is work with the student loan industry. That seems to be the main purpose for their existence. You talk about a symbiotic relationship between government and corporations. Fascism. That's what fascism is. That is what the Department of Education does. It has a revolving door. You walk into the Department of Education. You work for a few years and you serve the student loan industry. Not students. The student loan industry. And if you do your time and if you do it well and if you're obedient to the student loan industry, then after two or three years you can walk out that door and you can go get a nice high paying job with the student loan industry. It's called a revolving door. Meanwhile, people in the student loan industry, they will leave the student loan industry temporarily to go into the Department of Education. <coughs> Excuse me. Exceedingly cold out here today. They leave the student loan industry to go into the Department of Education. Why would they do that? Why would you go from that high paying job in the student loan industry to go work in a civil servant salary? Because you're turning the Department of Education into the slave of the student loan industry. You are working for the student loan industry when you switch over to the Department of Education. The Department of Education, in my mind, is nothing more than the student loan industry. I don't see what else it does. I don't, I don't see what other function it even does on a daily basis, except serve the student loan industry. Which is going to be threat number five that we will talk about. The last thing I will say on education is this. Liberals mount attacks against homeschooling. They hate the idea of homeschooling. Oh my goodness, a parent actually teaching their own children. What used to happen until 100, 150 years ago when we started having public schools in this country, which frankly we never should have had in the first place. It's not the government's job. It's the parent's job. It's the parent's job to go out there in a free market. That's where you get people competing to be the best educators the law of supply and demand, something that is not taught to people. Do you see how all of this ties together? So the liberal, the radical left, they mount all these attacks against homeschooling. They accuse them of being this, that, and the other thing. It's just like anything else in life. There's good, there's bad, there's in between. It, 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 you can't just call out homeschooling because of a couple bad apples. You can't do that. That's bad thinking. That's not critical thinking. Anyone who says something like that is demonstrating such bad thinking that I don't want them having anything to do with education because they're demonstrating how poor their own education is. They have no business commenting on homeschooling. If you're a well-educated parent and you want to raise your children to be equally well-educated and not indoctrinated by people who you completely disagree with and have no business teaching your children what they consider moral and ethical lessons, then you have every right and every responsibility to teach your children yourself or to use a free market to go out and find people who you trust to teach your children. Okay, Philip of Macedon, he trusted Aristotle to teach his son, Alexander the Great. He didn't go get some random Yahoo. He went and he got Aristotle. We're not getting Aristotle. The thing is, when you do homeschooling, you're teaching children, A, you're educating them well in all areas. Mathematics, literature, um, you know, ling linguistics, history, science. I haven't even mentioned science yet. I don't even want to go there. It is so bad. We'll talk about that later. When students have these capabilities, they have this good education in these fields, they become good citizens, but they also become powerful citizens. They have power as a citizen. And I don't mean they elevate themselves above others to take over and become a tyrant. I mean that they have the power that a citizen of this country is supposed to have. We are all supposed to be powerful. 
we are supposed to be in control of this government. And the idea of an education system, which is part of this government, coming back to all of us and saying, we are going to educate your children the way we want to, and you have nothing to say about it. And if you try to say anything about it, we're going to send the government's big old gun over to your house. We might even take away your kids. When that happens, you've got a tyrannical government. You've got what we fought against in the Declaration of Independence in the first place. And I urge you to think about that. Before I move on to number five, the student loan racketeering industry, I have to move this car because I have a school bus driver over there who is doing something really nasty. And it's creeping me out. Please forgive my tone in this particular video, but you don't know what it's like to be homeless and to think that you're find out that you're nothing more than a sideshow for these kind of psychos. The very psychos who are allowed to live and sleep in a nice warm home and a warm bed and deliver your children to these rotten schools. I'm going to leave you with just one more vision of this guy, alright? Empty parking lot, empty park. Parks right where he can watch me. This is the American education system, folks. It is an existential threat to the United States of America. Thank you for watching. Come back for number five.